you have to have a mindset in business that if you stop growing, you start dying. Right. And when I when I look at other professional service firms that start to go in the wrong direction, it's usually because there was a failure to think about the future. There was a failure to to stay focused on growth, to stay focused on layering in the next generation of professional at every position to continue forward. In today's episode of the Hero of the Hour podcast, Mark talks with the best of the best, Bill Barrett, author, speaker, and CEO of the law firm in New Jersey, Mandelbaum Barrett. Today, you'll get to learn about the challenges of running a business in the modern world, transactional relationships with attorneys and how they work, and last but not least, common issues that cross through different professions and businesses. You are in for a wonderful episode ahead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Murphy, founder and CEO of Northeast Private Client Group and author of three books. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for joining my podcast. Uh, I believe heroes and entrepreneurs require a sort of an anything is possible mindset. And you've proven just that. So I, I just want to start by, you know, first of all, I want to let our audience know that Bill and I are very, very close friends. We work very, very closely together that, you know, Probably 35 plus years ago, I decided I wanted to be a hero to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial thinking people. And Bill wanted to be a hero to the same group. And that's why we've had this entrepreneurial synergy and not only changing the lives of all the people we touch, all the clients we touch, all the people that we work with, but also each our other our, our own lives as well. And so, Bill, I just want to start by saying, how do you define a hero or, you know, you know who's a hero to you? Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of people um, that I could start with in terms of who's a hero to me. Um, but I, I would say that um, number one on the list would uh, would have to be my dad, I would say, uh, because I learned, uh, like many do with, with their parents, you learn many lessons. But I think the lessons I learned from my dad were not only great lessons um, in, in life, but they really served me well in, in business as well. And in some respects, I don't even think I realized until I got older the influence that it had and how it impacted my um, my professional life. No, that's a, I mean, I think, you know, I know a lot of your clients. I think to a lot of your clients, you're a hero to them. How do you think you're a hero to your clients? So why do you think they think that? Because I, I believe it. I know that to be true. How do you see it? Well, I've always felt that that the most exciting thing about what I do or the privilege that I have every day is to really become an important part of of a person's life. Um, it's not lost upon me, especially for all the closely held business owners and entrepreneurs that I represent that, you know, they're letting me into their universe, their, um, you know, their family, their business and the the advice or counsel or guidance that I that I give them. Uh, not, you know, it has a profound impact on their career, their life, the success of their business. And I made that choice very consciously. You know, when I started my career, I, I, I was very focused on, you know, I, I had to go to a top 10 law school and get into the best school. And then, and why did I have to do that? Because I'm going to work in New York city at a worldwide law firm and, and, and I'm going to do transactions. And I, I had a very set goal in mind of what it all was going to look like. And then I got there and, um, you know, it's not that these firms aren't great firms with, you know, you know um, I mean, I learned a lot. I was exposed to some really uh, incredible people and, 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 you know, worldwide companies and clients. But for me personally, what I realized was that it, it was a little unfulfilling for me because there came a time when I realized when I was working on a transaction that I was really helping some, you know, very nice, but very, you know, mid-level vice president at some big company achieve a bonus uh, by getting a deal done. I wasn't really changing anybody's life. I wasn't. Um, uh, and and I also felt that at, the, at that really high level, you know, we'll call it that Wall Street, uh, New York City high level. I really felt like people were treated very much in a disposable fashion, whether you were a lawyer, an investment banker, an accountant. Uh, and even the people that you worked with at the particular corporation or, or the client, 
the, it, it was relatively impersonal and, and, and I found that part of it to be really disappointing. So when I was figuring out what the rest of my life was going to look like and, and decisions I had to make, and I was still a young lawyer at the time, um, I was blessed to have a life-changing dinner um, with my mentor, Barry Mandelbaum, where he talked to me about how much he had been enjoying and loving his career and the impact he made on people and how he had clients that he was now on to the, the second generation of uh, of family companies, which by the way, now we're on to fourth generation in some <laughs> cases, which is pretty amazing. And I walked away from that dinner and I felt like I, I had this path forward because I was going to you know, leave New York City and, and a big worldwide law firm. And some of my friends there thought I was nuts because they were like, you know, this is the job everybody wants to get and you're you're going somewhere else. Um, and at the time when I joined my firm, it, it, we were about 20 lawyers and, uh, you know, today we're over 100 lawyers. So, you know, a lot has happened. A lot has changed. But yet nothing has changed in the sense that our ideal client are still these closely held companies and businesses. And, um, you know, it's just great to be able to have such a fulfilling career where when I when I accomplished something at the end of a day, it made a real impact on somebody's life. And um, and it's just much more meaningful for me personally. You know, I think, you know, some of the, the, the criticisms I think lawyers get in general is that they may be brilliant at their particular area of the law and, and you and your partners are brilliant at, at your area of the law. But I, I think they get criticized by entrepreneurs in that they uh, don't have an entrepreneurial mindset or they don't create that kind of ex an experience for their clients. It's 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 very uh, you know very clinical. How do you how do you how do you take that one step further? How does how does a client of Mandelbaum Barrett have that kind of experience that, that they might not get? Yeah, well, I I think that for starters, I know myself and 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 many of, of my partners, you know, we're also entrepreneurs. Um, I always remind people that at the end of the day, I run a business that, you know, that I've now built to, you know, close to 200 employees between lawyers and staff. And, you know, I'm facing all the same issues on a daily basis that the, the clients I represent are, are facing, um, you know, in terms of developing business, developing a brand, dealing with employees, you know, w deciding whether or not to make an acquisition or, you know, what what areas of business or in our case, practice areas are 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 going to be cutting edge that you need to adapt to changes in in business and the economy. I mean, we're all dealing with the same issues. Um, and I think that, again, being at an entrepreneurial mindset law firm where myself and many of my partners um, are involved also in our own outside business endeavors, whether it be in, in investing in real estate or in different businesses and, and companies, um, you know, we, we have kind of a different out, outlook and, and see the world through the same lens uh, as our entrepreneurial clients. So I think that is uh, a, a big difference. And um, it used to always strike me again, going back to like the comparison between some yeah. law firms and, and our law firm, it used to strike me that I would hear lawyers say, well, I can't really opine on that because that's a business question, meaning they would only want to be on the narrow focus of right. it. It had to be a legal question or they wouldn't even answer it. And I used to say to myself, how can someone be advising a business if they don't even have an opinion on business? They, you know, they only want to speak about legal issues. And I just found that to be so counterintuitive that, you know, how could you be counseling business owners if you don't have an opinion? Um, so I've just always been bold about saying to a client, look, at the end of the day, I'm your advocate and whatever course you choose to go on, I'm going to be by your side. Whether I agree with you or not, I'm your advocate and I'm going to try to help you accomplish what it is you're trying to accomplish. But if you wanted a wilting violet, you hired the wrong person because I'm also going to tell you when I think you're making a mistake or when I would do it differently. And I'm going to tell you what I would do and what my business opinion is on what it is that you're, you know, embarking on. And it's just kind of the way I'm, I'm hardwired. And, you know, again, which is why a firm like ours is suited for me and maybe not, not for others because, you know, we enjoy and embrace 
business and and have an opinion uh, beyond just the legal work that we do. So, I mean, it's something that um, if I was missing that component, I don't think I would enjoy what I do every day. You know, I know both of us are voracious readers and we mastermind and we both studied with uh, Dan Sullivan, the strategic coach. But one of the things that just kind of occurred to me from our conversation is you've already done, everybody talks about 10X. You've already 10X your business from 20 people to 200. How are you going to take it from 200 to 2000? And it's probably going to be with different strategies that took you from 20 to 200. I mean, do you think about that? What do you think? What do you think about you think about the next 10X? I do. I, I, I think it's a couple of things. Number one, you have to have a mindset in business that if you stop growing, you start dying. Right. And when I when I look at other professional service firms that start to go in the wrong direction, it's usually because there was a failure to think about the future. There was a failure to to stay focused on growth to stay focused on layering in the next generation of professional at every position to continue forward. And I also think um, that some people have limiting beliefs. So if, you, if your mindset is that, wow, we've come really far, I don't know how we would go any further than this, you're going to be in trouble because you're not going to go any further than this. I think you have to look at examples around you uh, you know, of businesses, and you can see them all over where an idea or someone who, you know, started something out of their garage um, became a, you know, a, a huge enterprise and and understand that you can't have limiting beliefs. So for me, it's the, it's twofold. It's it's you can't have limiting beliefs. And yeah, you, you have to have a mindset of if I stop growing, I start dying. So and, and that's in everything in life. You know, it's it's with your your intellect, your views on the world, uh, you know, being a, a learner in terms of, uh, you know, always having intellectual curiosity because you want to know more and learn more. All these things tied tied together in into a growth mindset, in, in my view. You know, obviously, we've been I'm so proud as your friend to say this. I know you would never say this or you don't certainly don't talk about it a lot, but um after over 90 years, uh, uh, Mandelbaum Salzburg uh, changed its name to Mandelbaum Barrett a year or so ago. Uh, I'm so proud for you. It's so well-deserved. Uh, I know Mandelbaum Barrett uh, appears on the best places to work, the best law firms. You know, Every list known to man, your, your firm seems to wind its way on. How does that make you feel? You, you, it's okay to feel. It's okay to. It's it's okay not to brag a little bit, but just to feel so proud of what you've accomplished. I mean, because you'd never oh. do it. I I, I want to brag. If you don't brag, I'm going to brag for you. <laughs> well, I well, first of all, I <laughs> I'm grateful, and I and I I really do appreciate that. And um, I mean, sure, it you know it it does feel great, and it, I I think for me personally, um, again, tracing it back to kind of how I started my my career. You know, I, I was at a worldwide law firm where the two managing partners, the named partners, had been dead for a hundred years. Okay. I mean, it was so so my mindset in terms of my personal planning, my personal business plan, my goals was never to have my name on on the door of a of, of a law firm. Um, not that I don't think it's a great thing. I I do. But it just wasn't kind of something that I had a mindset as being necessary or, you know, uh, and maybe, you know, I think we all have a, a a certain size ego at some point, but that wasn't part of my my shtick, if you will. Um, and I never asked for it and it wasn't something I, on my my radar. And, and I suppose for me, the reason why it, it it really is meaningful and I do feel great about it is that. I didn't ask for it. And it was something that my partners who I all, you know, all of whom I respect and admire bestowed that honor upon me. And the idea came from them um, that a, they thought that I had, that I deserved it and that I had my loyalty to the law firm and my sacrifice on behalf of the law firm, you know, was worthy of it. Um, and also they thought that it was a way to, to bridge our, our storied past, you know, as you pointed out, you know, 92 years in, in business with, with our bright future and our growth. And, you know, um, 
and and you know I I feel honored to be you know the symbol and essence of of where we're going, um, and to be connected to where we've been, which of course is is a real honor. So, um, you know, it is a surreal thing. Still, it happened in January, and I have to say, I I drive into the parking lot and I see my name on a, on a building, and and sometimes it just really didn't sink in that like wow yeah you know my name's on this firm now and i'm you know i've always been incredibly proud uh to be part of the firm and it it, it does certainly um up the ante if you will when when you see your name there i think that whatever pressures you may have put on yourself um uh, not only to to do the right thing and to and to to do good work and so forth you you now also you know think about all the people that the organization supports and provides a livelihood for and and just how important it is to to continue that legacy forward so it, thank you for bragging for me and and giving me a chance to reflect on it um because it is really an honor that my partners bestowed on me and i'm i'm very grateful for it you know one of the things when you get a chance to be reflective and you talk about like i'm thinking about you know your firm and your career you think you, you hark back to your own and you go one of the things i'm proudest of is not all the money we've made or even and and not just all the clients that we've helped over the years and continue to help, but it's it's I I think sometimes even about my team, the people that have worked for me that uh, you know that from what we've created here, the amount of people that paid their mortgages and bought the house they wanted or sent their kids to college or had a little bit better life because of what we created, and and I get such joy I, I get as much joy out of that as I get out of anything, in in. Uh, in seeing how we've, you know, how it's been, what we like to refer to as a class three experience. It's been great for our, our clients, hopefully first. It's been great for all the people that work with us and for us. And then it's been great for us third. And so, I, I mean, I, I know we, we we talk about that a lot. And, you know, I just, it just makes me feel so optimistic and so prideful about that. And it makes you just want to do more and help more people. Um, I, I think, you know, I think I'm always at my best when I'm serving others. And I, I know you are as well. Um, you know, yeah. one of the things I don't care if you're a Christian, a Jew, an atheist, a Muslim, a deist, uh, you know, I, I I've left out a, a million different religions and <laughs> that there, I think we either grow up with guilt or we learn guilt in school. <laughs> and, and so, so that, that idea, one of the things that I always find fascinating when you talk about is the challenge is always time and attention. There's 24 hours in a day. You've got a very successful business obviously you've got a successful marriage you've got two incredible children who i know who i've gotten a chance to know um how do you make your business life your personal life you know your, your family life and your personal life all work at the same time knowing there's only a 24-hour day and still not uh and still get a three or four hours of sleep every night yeah. I, I love when you comment on this because i think that virtually everybody who's in business or anybody that's alive today has the same challenges and they, and they think they're the only one facing it. And I think they realize that everyone's got that problem. Yeah. So I, I, <laughs> I wish I could say that I cornered the market on perfection in this regard, but uh, I, I'm not so sure that, that, that anyone has um, for, I always say that, you know, you've got these three components, right? You've got, you've got your family, which I, which, which is and should be number one. You've got your profession, your career, the, and and what you do to um, to make a living, and 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 then you have yourself, right, and and your own personal well being, or the things that give you personal satisfaction, or even just taking care of yourself, exercising, things like that. And I always say to people that I feel like I can kind of crush it at any given time at two of the three, right? And it, and it's so hard you know, I think for all of us to kind of thread the needle and have all three going at the same time, you know, it's kind of like, I feel like, well, you know, when I'm, when I'm coaching a sport for my kids and I'm, and I'm really all in and I've, I feel like things are humming along with the family and, uh, and I'm, you know, busy at work and I'm taking care of clients and it's going great. It usually means that I'm falling off the wagon exercising or <laughs> I'm not eating as well as I wish I I could. And, um, and I, and I think over the years, it, it's gotten better because I've I've come to a realization that that what we do is part of who we are, and and I think that 
when people try to create these separations, like that there's got to be these separations among the three, um, I, I think that what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for for a game that is very hard to win. You know, that threading of the needle where, yeah, you know, my family life is rocking and and my business is cranking and I'm making money and do, helping people and all this great stuff. And I'm going to the gym five days a week. I'm lifting weights. I'm doing cardio and I'm on a, you know, a plant-based diet and, you know, I'm 6% body fat and, and I've got the whole <laughs> world figured out. I, I think that that might happen here and there in your life, but it's probably pretty much, you know, a, a ridiculous expectation. And and then what I, what I realized was, you know, Biz, you know, my friends in many respects are are, are my clients, yeah. and and I, I started to realize that when your life kind of like blends it all together, where your your families are friends with other families who you also happen to do work for, or maybe they do work for you, and and maybe we work out together or we go on a vacation together, and I just started to realize that I don't have to have my life doesn't have to be so separated. Um, and that when I've kind of just like be myself and just let let myself flow and and you know that I think that that all of a sudden you realize that it's a little more manageable than you thought by also getting you know your expectations in in line that that those three perfect buckets with total separation you know might be a little bit of a ridiculous demand on yourself. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. It's it's a constant challenge. I, I never think I'm giving my business too much time. I never think I'm giving my children too much time. I never think I'm doing enough things for myself or for my own, you know, health and well-being. It's I never think I'm being good enough partner to Lisa. I never I never think I'm good I'm just like I'm like, you know, and but you do the very best you can. It almost it's like I think of Vince Lombardi, we want to be perfect, so hopefully once in a while we catch a glimpse of excellence. <laughs> um but it's a, it's it's a it's a challenge there. You know, one of the things that is one of my pet peeves with our clients as it relates to attorneys is that I find our clients that have transactional relationships with attorneys is they go because, you know, you, you, you know attorneys, you know, charge for time, you know, for the most part, you know, that's most of the way they get paid. And so they have a transactional relationship with them. And I, you know, I need a will. I'll see a tax attorney. I have a litigation matter. I need to see a litigation attorney. I've got a corporate matter. I need to see a corporate attorney or whatever the, the, you know, the, the law of the law is that, and they just take care of that issue. And I think that so many times that if they had a transformational relationship with their attorney, where they had a real relationship with the attorney they'd work with, particularly for entrepreneurs that have lots of moving pieces together, if they had that kind of relationship, that they could not only get much better results in their business, and I'm not talking about legal results, I'm talking about business results and life results, but so many of these things interact and there's so much synergy that when they treat it like a silo, like in a transaction, they they never get the best results. And it's always it it, it always winds up being low, you know, a lower result in the long run by doing it that way. How do you coach people to do it? Or do you see the same thing, or is that just something I see? No, there's no question about that. You know, for example, if somebody calls me up for a particular uh, business transaction and maybe it's a, a bit of a sophisticated matter and they lead with the question of what do you charge for this? You know, and I don't even know what the deal is about yet. I haven't asked them a whole bunch of questions that I have to ask them to kind of really dig in and understand the deal. Those tend to be people that that look at it very transactionally, right? That they're, that all this is, is I have to get to a conclusion. I've been told I need you to help me get to that conclusion. What are you going to do? What is it going to cost? And that's the end of it. And and it's it's a bad mindset for for anybody in, in any human interaction, I, I think. Um, because the the relationship if and and relationships with anybody you know if if they become transformational and it's a real bond and a real relationship and it's more than just the one matter there's so many other things that can come from it you know the the advice and and strategic thinking and and the what you know the one of the things i always talk about all the time too is that like when i bring somebody into my my universe um whether they're a client or or another relationship in 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 business, it, I I don't just give myself to them, which I which I do, but you know I I kind of 
open up the books, if you if you will, and you know they they have access to everyone I know and the relationships I have and anything that I can do to make their life better and to you know as you like to say you know be be a hero to them. It doesn't have to be in legal work that where words got put on a piece of paper and a signature got on the paper and and that was your value. It could be, um, you know, I've had situations over the years where, you know, one client would be a perfect customer for another client and making those introductions or, um, you know, where I realize there's a professional that could be helping other clients of mine and I can and, and I can change everybody's life by making those those introductions or, you know, um, I had a client just recently where. Uh, you know, they they had there's a particular bill that is upsetting them that's that's in uh, committee right now in the legislature. And, um, you know, I I was able to introduce um, my client and friend uh, to some key senators that happen to be friends uh, of mine who are in the process of contemplating this bill and just gave him an opportunity as a you know, to be able to express some of the concerns that maybe aren't you know, aren't being expressed while they're going through the analysis. And, and that was incredibly transformational and valuable and it has nothing to do with legal work. It's just, you know, we're, we're, we're friends, clients, part of the same universe. And you, you want it to be an all encompassing re- relationship and, and not just, you know, as you point out, you know, I need a will, what are you going to do? What's it going to cost me? I mean, if that's what someone's looking for, um, you know, that that's to me that's not a relationship that i'm that i'm interested in because it's incredibly unfulfilling uh, that's to me we we have a few customers we have mostly clients uh, i'm not yeah. interested in customers you know they're they're you know that uh you know you want you want people like yourself you want people that are hard working and loyal and appreciate your expertise and reciprocate and use their big thinking people and and have integrity and you know all those things and i, I just think you want uh you know, you want you want to attract those types of people in your life, which which you do. You know, one of the things I've noticed also about the work that you do and your firm does is, I think very good practitioners in all areas, not just the law. It could be accounting, it could be in finance, like myself. It could be in real estate, or it could be in any place. Is they always say, you know, treat people how you want to be treated. But I think what the very best do is they don't treat people how you want to be treated. They treat people how they want to be treated. And and that the delivering an experience or a product the way they want it, not, not the way you want it performed, is the difference between good, the good ones and the great ones. You have any yeah. comment? You have any comment on that? Does that does that ring true to you? Yeah, well, I, for for sure. Um, you know, look, the at the end of the day, I I I always tell people that that, you know, if if you look and search hard enough anybody can find a, an attorney that that can take a, a set of terms and turn it into an agreement or you know get you from from point a to point b but how do you differentiate yourself right and um you differentiate yourself in a lot of the ways we we talked about but also in in really trying to get to understand the client and and their needs and what's important to them. I always ask people, not just like what they need me to do, but I always try to ask if this was a blank canvas and, and you could paint whatever picture you wanted to get to the, the what does the perfect outcome look like to you? You know, what, what is the perfect outcome, you know, in, in your business, in this matter, in life, whatever it is, what does the perfect outcome look like? Because then once I know what, what the perfect outcome or, or, or a great outcome for them looks like, then I can package up my abilities, the abilities of my team, my friends, my contacts, and deliver them to the person in a, in a way that tries to help get them to the ideal outcome. And, and that's how I try to be a hero to those, to those folks is, is to, you know, uh, it's not like the Bill Barrett outcome, like what I think is a great outcome. Because I could think it's amazing and, <laughs> and it could be disappointing. But, you know, wh- what is their ideal outcome? And if you don't ask that question, 
no matter who you are, no matter what type of professional you are, if you're not asking them what the ideal outcome looks like for them, I think no matter what your profession is, you're missing the boat. You know, you know, it's, it's funny. The, uh, the, uh, you know, when, um, you talk about relationships and building relationships, when Lucas, who's 20, gonna be 24, uh, was in kindergarten. He used to say, well, what does your dad do for a living? You have to say in kindergarten, what your father does. And he got up and he told the class, my father has breakfast and lunch with his friends. And, uh, <laughs> So, so I, 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 at first I was insulted by it. And then I thought, well, that's exactly what I do is I, you get up every day and you, 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 you turn your, your people that you work with are your friends and you're helping make their lives better. And then I had a conversation this past weekend with my son, Bennett, who's now in college. And uh, he was saying to me, you know, dad, I, I don't know if I want to do what you do. And I think that's great. I think he should do whatever he wants to do. But he said, I really want to be an advisor. I might even want to be a psychologist. And I kept thinking, and I th- go back, and I go, first of all, it had nothing to do with him. He should do what he wants to do in his career. I've made my choices, and he should make his. But I'm saying, one of the things I think is, I think I'm one of the best paid psychologists, like, you know, uh, social workers in the country, in that our, our work has, you know, that everything is psychological. Money is not math; it's psychological. The law is not is not the law; it's it's psychological. I, I think we're, I, I think we're amateur psychologists more than we are lawyers or financial advisors. That that is completely true. There, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, a, a big portion of of what we, we all do is is in essence being a psychologist, and um, and it goes back again to trying to help people get get to the ideal outcome and and try to understand what makes them tick and and how um, and you know how you can help them. Uh, you know, it's like uh, you know putting even you know I had a, a situation where. Uh, you know, two partners were having some difficulties and, you know, it was like, um, I felt like I was a marriage counselor, <laughs> you know, it was like, well, well, you know, he doesn't listen to to anything that I'm saying and he doesn't respect what I'm doing. And <laughs> he thinks that only his side of the business is the important side. And it sounds a lot like, you know, when a couple is having uh, challenges. So there was, I don't think there was anything I advised in that phone call that had anything to do with a legal issue. It was all about how to get them to communicate better. So go figure. You know, we didn't rehearse this, so I, you know, I don't know if I'm catching off guard or not with this question. But I'm going: is there one or two things that seem to be not universal, but come up time and time again with clients, and they think that they're the only person going through that when when the whole world's going through that? Well, I do think um, I, I do think there's a lot of common issues that that cross you know, through different professions and different businesses and and they are, you know, very similar. And a great example is, you know, in, in the last year or two, for example, you know, how many clients in different industries did you have who said, my biggest challenge right now is getting good people. Right. 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 I mean, that was universal, whether you owned a, a law firm, an accounting firm, a restaurant, you know, uh, uh, you were a dentist, uh, fill, fill in the blank, uh, the, the biggest challenge, uh, and, and it's, and it's across, you know, er, it, it transcends everything. So I, I think that, you know, that's why I think a lot of, um, peer organizations actually are very, are very helpful. Um, and, and they have proven track records of working because if you put people at a round table and you could have eight people, they could be, Men, women come from all different backgrounds and with one th- common thing that the eight of them all own a business, the, the conversation and the, the exchange of information and, and advice and guidance that people give each other is, ends up being universal, right? And I think like you mentioned the strategic coach before where you know we've both studied um, – and how many times are you sitting at a table, at strategic coach, and every person at the table is in a completely different, you know, profession or business or line of work, but yet we do a breakout session and everyone's giving each other thoughts and ideas about whatever issues they're dealing with. And you get all this great advice from, from peers. I, I think it underscores the fact that, that, you know, uh, and by the way, I like a politician. I, I answered your question without ever answering your question, but, um, I, no, I, I think, I think, I think people, t- people took a lot of it. By the way, I want to get this right because you have written two books uh, so far. I and uh, 
One was called Pain-Free Dental Deals, An Entrepreneurial Dentist Guide to Buying, Selling, and Merging Practices. I know in this book, you and Casey, your co-author, explain the process of buying and selling or merging a practice in order in order to uncover the smoothest and most profitable path forward. And that's universal to every business. And then you also have the, the latest book, which is getting rave reviews, is the DSO Decision, uh, Winning Answers from Every Angle. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, I, uh, you know, before I met you, you were not an author. Now you're an author of two books. Uh, uh, what, what did you, what, what did, uh, what do you think, what did you get? What, why did you write the books? And, and what do you think your, your clients and prospective clients and partners get from your books? Yeah. Well, first of all, I owe you um, a debt of gratitude because you had already um, authored two books. Um, and at the time uh, when, you know, we, decided to do these books. And I saw, um, you know, it kind of inspired me to say, uh, yeah, I could do this, you know, because, you know, coming along throughout my career, my life, I never sat around and said, oh, I know I'm going to write, I'm going to write some books. Um, and it would have been something that I would have thought, you know, may, maybe not not necessary for, for me, or maybe not a skill set that I'd have, but you inspired me to do it. And the, the first book, I, I, I thought, I, I was talking to someone one day um, and we were just telling stories and I ended up, you know, having two or three stories that were relevant to what they were talking about, what I'll call horror stories where, you know, somebody comes to you where something's gone wrong for them. And now your job as a professional is to help them unwind it and figure it out and make it all better. Um, so the person said to me, man, you know, if you could package up those stories in in a, in a book, and 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 give it out to people, that it would be so helpful because they could avoid so many pitfalls or or you know making mistakes. And I realized that not only had I done a ton of uh, mergers and acquisitions transactions in many different spaces, but I had now handled quite a few transactions in healthcare and and in particular with with dentistry. I, I started compiling a list of of every story I could think of where somebody came to me and I went, oh my gosh, you know, that's a that's a problem or that that was a, a snafu that could have been avoided. And I and I compiled it and put it in, into a book and that became, you know, pain free dental deals. Um, and as you said, it, it the stories apply to, you know, any type of business. Um, I just happened to focus that one in that space. The DSO decision similarly. Um, came about because I was getting so many calls from clients asking my guidance and advice on on what was happening in consolidation. And um, you know, right now in the in in the country, there's a number of different areas where you see consolidation. You see it with insurance agencies. You see it uh, in dentistry. It's happening in veterinary. It already happened in, happened in optometry and. And and you're just seeing it, at, you know, professional service firms where where you, you see consolidation going on. And I had seen so much again on on the dental side, um, and I was getting these calls from clients. With, they were just curious, and I thought, you know, if I just compile all these questions I'm getting on a daily basis over the course of a year, it could turn into a book that would provide a tremendous amount of information for people. And so we did it. And and that has actually turned out to be, I think, even um, as popular, if not even more popular than the first book. Um, so, you know, now all this has inspired me to to write a third book. And, you know, I'm putting myself to the challenge of getting that book underway in 2023. That's going to be my my goal. So, um, you know, what I noticed, what that. I noticed for your books are are. Uh... There's a n lot of knowledge in it, and you but you can get knowledge from the internet or from Google or from those sort of things. What I notice about when I read your books, I notice there's a lot of wisdom there, and you can't find that in Google or you can't find that in a, in a textbook. And um, I think that's the differentiator. I think that that's the you know that's what I that's what I take out of, out of uh, the books that you uh, you write and will continue to write. Thank well, you. I, I just want to uh, just want to thank you, Bill, for taking the time today. And uh, as I just said, I, I am uh, I feel lucky to have you in my life, and I uh, I just uh, am excited to see what uh, 
what the, what the next decade we have together is going to look like. Cause I think we're going to have an awful lot of fun and do an awful lot of good things for a lot of people. And, uh, I, uh, I I treasure you and treasure your uh, your your friendship. Well, thanks, Mark. I I really appreciate you having me on, and you know I feel the same way, obviously, about you. Uh, the beauty uh, is, you know, for us is that you know we get to go to work and uh, do things together, uh, and to do it with one of your best friends, uh, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, you know, go running around the country helping people with your best friend uh, is is not a is not a bad way to make a living, and you know, and who would have thought that I'd, you know, become such good friends with a with a guy who turns out to be a Ranger fan? I mean, if <laughs> you know, this could have been a marriage, Mark. <laughs> it's the, uh, it's. I'm hoping we'll get at least to the finals and maybe the Stanley Cup. Uh, it's been uh, it's been going on almost 30 years, so we'll. Uh, <laughs> we don't want to jinx it, but yeah. uh, Bill, have a have a great rest of the, of the day, and and thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Thanks for having me on. Bye bye.